Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, webinar. This is uh, Howard Mann again. This week, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we'll start with Travis. So I'll give him the screen. Okay, you guys, do you see a Rankinogram? Yep. So this is a portable radiograph from, from last week and I'll show you the uh, the time here. So this was in the morning and then later that day, you can see the patient has an impella. Uh, he's ill, he's intubated, he has some combination of edema, like hydrostatic edema from heart failure and perhaps some permeability edema as well. Uh, let's see, let me bring this one over. And so this was the follow-up radiograph. And you can see now that his impella has been, uh, has been dislodged. Now we've talked, I know Howard has shown cases of impellas before, and these have differential pressure sensors so that the, the computer that this is hooked up to knows if this is across the aortic valve or not. This is, of course, the part you want in the left ventricular cavity. And so clearly this has been pulled back into the aorta and what's interesting about this is that it was intentionally pulled back. This was not dislodged by accident. And I thought that was what was very interesting. This, this um, impella abruptly stopped working and it, it, the device just failed. And so the cardiologist pulled it back and then they replaced it the next day. So this was a, an intentional removal from, so that it wasn't crossing the aortic valve anymore. And this is just a quick note before they went back to the cath lab. So he had, he had at least enough left ventricular function that he was able to survive a few hours or at least an hour before taking back to the cath lab. So I thought that was kind of interesting and uh, it's all, why it's always valuable to look at the chart and see what's going on you know, before reflexively calling just to say something's been screwed up because th in this case, this was intentional. Now, if it was failing, Travis, um, any harm in just leaving it the way it was? If it I think wasn't doing I, I think they didn't comment on the rationale, but my guess is just <clears throat> since it's crossing the aortic valve, that it may you know negatively affect native left ventricular function. I didn't get a chance to talk to the surgeon, but that would be my guess. But I don't know for sure. I don't know. If, if anyone else has seen this before or encountered this problem, but that would that would be my assumption. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a reason why why they pulled it back if they were going to replace it or if it wasn't functioning, what harm it would do to leave it in. I'm trying to think, but I can't right off think of a reason. Yeah, other than just the effect it would have on the native aortic valve function. That would be my, my guess. Hmm. Okay. Now this one is kind of a cool case and it's a, I actually have two related cases. This is one from a couple of weeks ago. And this is a 41 year old man who had worsening cough for about a year, finally sought medical attention. And you can see that he has a fibrosing interstitial lung disease on this CT. And it's a, it's a very peculiar pattern. You can see it's very, it's very spatially homogeneous in the lower lobes. It's a very diffuse process with ground glass, some traction, some little cystic spaces. You know, some of this you might argue is honeycombing, but it certainly doesn't have a strictly subpleural or even a basal predominance. It's a very diffuse process. You know, I guess it is slightly more in the lower lobes than in the upper lobes, but the, the axial distribution is, is fairly uniform. Now, he you know, does not have a family history of, of interstitial lung disease. He does not smoke. Uh, he does have a relevant uh, uh, occupational exposure that I'll show you in a, in a moment after I show you the pathology on this. And this turns out to be a giant cell interstitial pneumonia, so a hard metal pneumoconiosis. Oh. And I think, Howard, I think you and, and maybe David have shown these before, or maybe Jeff, I mean, we don't see this that often. Uh, but what's really interesting about him is that he is a dental technician and has been for 20 years, and that he polishes the metal, he does the metal finishing, as you can see here, 
and that the um, some of the equipment that he works with has cobalt tungsten in it, uh, which is really interesting. And and I included this, and he he talks about how you know, the ventilation system is supposed to be changed regularly. It sounds like it's not. Also, he doesn't wear a mask at his job, and so and he had no other exposures to other things that you know typically that we think of causing. Uh, interstitial lung disease. So giant cell interstitial pneumonia, of course, considered a, a pneumoconiosis. It's a, a hard metal pneumoconiosis. I include one case series from the early 2000s where they had four reports. And, you know, I don't think there's anything really, you know, that, you know, that's a, a hallmark on imaging as opposed to on pathology where you see these, these large intraalveolar giant cells. Here's one example where they just talk about crown glass and reticular opacities and kind of generic, some patients with, with honeycomb. And I think this one looks fairly similar where you have these cystic spaces, not strictly in a subpleural distribution. So Howard or David, if you guys have any additional information to comment on this, because we don't see a lot of this. No, that's just a really wonderful case. It really indicates the importance when, particularly when you have an unusual non-classifiable pattern Right. History. I mean, they always say interstitial lung disease, getting the history is super important, but even more important in a case like this. Yeah. That's remarkable. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, this is one where you, you know, if somebody told you this was a UIP pattern on biopsy and IPF, you'd guess, especially in his age, that it was some sort of familial uh, fibrosis. But yeah, it was kind of an interesting case. Yeah. It's something else because <clears throat> if you look at the lungs, they are diffusely gray, number one. And yes. of course, in the lower lung zones, they're even grayer or ground glass, so that the lungs diffusely are abnormal, whereas with, at least with the usual UIP, <clears throat> between the abnormal regions, the lungs look okay, generally. Sure, right. It's that, it's that spatial heterogeneity, whereas this is a much more you know, spatially homogeneous. So if you're trying to go by ATS guidelines, you say, A, that there's diffuse ground glass, which makes it inconsistent with UIP, and B, it's a peribronchovascular distribution, at least in the lower lobes. <clears throat> so, um, how old was this guy, Travis? Forty-one. Wow. That's yeah. also that's also yeah. against against uh, IPF. Yeah. Of so course. Um, yeah. The, the 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 couple of cases I've seen of this, and I've seen only two or three, uh, were upper lung predominant, which is kind of what you'd expect for something being inhaled. Mm. But you know, so be it. Yeah. I think there's just not enough, there's, there, there's not enough numbers out there to conclusively to, you know, say one way or the other. And that leads me to this case, which I've been saving up for quite a while now. And um, I was going to show it because this is another interesting case. And, in, and this is a woman and she's 48. And you can see in her that she also has an interstitial lung disease. And in her, it's... You know, she's a very large woman, which has given us a little issues with signal to noise and, and photopenia here. But you can see that she has a fairly just extensive ground glass opacity and it has no, you know, maybe it's a little bit more upper lobe predominant, certainly peribronchovascular and not subpleural and fairly uniform distribution. No, um, no honeycombing in this case. There was no air trapping. Looks reasonable for you know maybe an NSIP pattern or maybe HP. You know they were unsure. She went to biopsy. This was a follow-up study after she had her biopsy, and I think she was started on steroids at this point. But this before also you, turned out to be before you <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, there was anything uh, connective tissue disorder. I always think of connective tissue disorder when you have strange patterns too. Of course, yeah, and especially in this um, in this age range, yeah, in a, in a woman who's in her forties. No history of connective tissue disease, nothing. Uh, ex there's only one relevant exposure that I will talk to, that I'll show you in a moment here. I'm gonna try and pull up this report. But this is a woman that went to biopsy and sure enough, she also had giant cell interstitial pneumo pneumonia. And this one is really interesting because if you look here after further discussion, she started vaping and our pulmonologist or our pathologist has done some research and we've been looking into this too. He had seen at least one case presentation of giant cell interstitial pneumonia in a patient with a vape pen at, at ATS or chest. 
And it turns out that a lot of vape pens, pens do have heavy metals in them like tungsten. And so that's the, the going theory is that this is heavy metal inhalation from her vaping pen. And I, I was doing a quick Google search and found a couple of things just talking about using tungsten as the, as the, um, as like a metal that, that gets superheated in the vape pens. But presumably that's the cause. He was actually, the, the pathologist is actually trying to acquire her vape pen and send it to the Livermore laboratory and see if they'll do mass spectroscopy on it. But um, yeah, so that's yeah. The presumptive cause of giant cell interstitial pneumonia. I guess on PATH, it, the diagnosis was, you know, unquestionably giant cell interstitial pneumonia. And that's the only thing they can figure out in her. So well, I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has seen vape pen issues yet. I remember, Brant probably remembers too. We had one case at Emory where a guy just had kind of non-specific ground glass opacities after he started vaping. But I think it's one of these new exposures that we may see, kind of like the synthetic marijuana and others. Fascinating. One, one thing I've heard about with vaping is that um, there are compounds like the popcorn flavoring agent, diacetyl, that are you. Yeah, and one of the articles I found here actually talked about um, it talked about tongues or uh, talked about diacetyl, and and I don't know I'm I'm trying to find them here. I'll look for an article while somebody else goes. I can't remember um, where they are, but yeah, but I, I think that's we feel like that's likely what this is. So another case of giant cell interstitial pneumonia. Very interesting. All right. Howard, that's it for me for today. All right. Yeah, thank you. Those are wonderful cases. Uh, David, I see you're on, obviously, and uh, Brent, any of you two would like to show cases? I have some cases. I can show some as soon as I clear my mouth a little bit later, so right now, <laughs> engage with lunch. Okay, we'll start with uh, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> I have a few cases here. Uh, this is a the first case of you can see the uh, the screen here. So um, presenting another um, case of a uh, transcatheter aortic valve here. Um, and um, this was an Edward Sapien valve, and this was a patient. We're we're doing um, a fair <laughs> amount of post uh, TAVI imaging now, uh, both routinely for various uh, studies and also. Um, if um, there's a gradient across the valve, and of course this this patient did have a uh, significant um, gradient across the uh, aortic valve, and so an indication here is to look for thrombus and valve uh, leaflet uh, mobility. And I'll just show you the um, the uh, MPR of this, and let me make sure I'm showing the right window here. Let me see. Can you see a uh, MPR here? Uh, it's um, starting to come up, but on my screen, it's just showing the toolbar. Oh, gosh, let me see. Funny. You see it now? Yes. Good. Okay. Okay, so I'm um, going to show you the uh, Cine uh, sequences here, but already you can see that there is abnormal thickening of the uh, bioprosthetic uh, tabu leaflets here. And let me just play this. Actually, it does this every time where it takes off my play bar. And I'm going it's to put it back on. Space bar, see if it goes. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now you can see that um, the tabu leaflets are uh, abnormally thickened here. Let me speed this up so you can kind of see the motion. Abnormally thickened, and they're also um, restricted in motion. So this one in particular, um, you know, at the base, uh, it's, it's just barely moving. Um, so I'm going to show you the uh, double bleak view here um, down the barrel of the, the valve. And you can see that this valve, um, you know, basically all the leaflets are thickened. And um, this is now called hypoattenuated um, leaflet thickening or halt um, in tabbies. And presumably this is, um, you know, this is assumed to be thrombus. And, it responds uh, in general to um, to uh, Coumadin. And so a lot of these patients are not on Coumadin to start with, and they're put on Coumadin after this is found. And 
um, this tends to resolve. So, um, so this was um, HALT, um, hypo attenuated leaflet thickening and HAM, which is um, the same with, um, with restricted um, motion. So um, causing motion restriction of the leaflet. So um, this patient was put on high, uh, or, well, put on uh, anticoagulation with warfarin and we'll see what happens, but just another case of um, TAVI uh, thrombus. Okay. okay, and here's a uh, case here. Um, if Travis is still on, he may like this, this case. Um, let's take a look at the chest CT first. Let me make sure I'm showing this. Okay, so th this is a patient who came in with um, uh, a prior history that I'll withhold for a second, but you can see as I'm look adjacent to the right um, interior pulmonary vein, um, there's a linear um, object there, and I'll change it kind of to an intermediate window here, and you can see that um, this is um, kind of abutting the inferior pulmonary vein, not quite within the pulmonary vein. It's kind of sitting in the mediastinal fat there. Um, let me let me uh, go back to an abdominal CT from a couple of years prior to this, and uh, we'll take a look at. Does it have a little bit of an L shape to it? Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> and um, let me see, make sure I'm showing. Can you all see the abdominal CT? Okay. Yes, we do. Um, okay. And we can see this IBC filter. And um, Travis, what kind of filter do you think this would be? That's got to be a bar G2 Express. Exactly. <laughs> and you can see that multiple, um, you know, struts are outside the um, IVC wall. In particular, look at this funny uh, one that's going outside and almost, you know, I was, I was wondering if it went into bowel, but it really doesn't go into bowel. It just, it's like a little area of local inflammation in the, um, in the mesentery there, um, presumably from that, that strut extending out there. So you wonder if there's a leak there, localized inflammation. Um, let me show you the, uh, the reformat looks really crazy um, on MIPS. Um, you can see that that strut is just really uh, wandering, you know, and so that's going extending outside of the IVC. Um, let me show you uh, the, this was on a retrieval uh, of that filter. The patient, a couple years after that CT, had the following um, procedure done to try to retrieve the valve. And um, on one of these sets of images, there's the, the snare and they're retrieving the valve. So they thought they were successful. Uh, but then in looking at the chest CT, somebody <laughs> had gone back, um, you know, astutely realized that um, perhaps on one of these images, one of these struts was in fact not there. You know, you can see that it's kind of missing there. So uh, presumably this is a um, migrated strut from the barred um, IVC filter that's just kind of sitting there um, my question is, you know, how did this, you know, migrate into the mediastinum in the location that, that it is? I mean, what what do you all think is the, the root <laughs> here? Because we're using these, we've seen them in the pericardium, we've seen them in the mitocardium, we've seen them in the mediastinum adjacent to the heart and pulmonary, you know, arteries. But how do you all think this? Huh. Um, I couldn't think of a good pathway, but... It, un unless it's in the, the little pericardial sleeve there, but I, I don't know. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe it's in, um, you know, we just can't see. Maybe it went into the pericardial sleeve and then and then perforated or something. Yeah, but yeah. I just thought there was, you know, a very interesting kind of yeah. sequence there. The abdomen so. and pelvis CT is nice because those, those things should have 12 struts. They have the six inner and six outer. And when you showed that one image, you could see that there's, six inner and only five outer, like right there, like just a little lower, right yep. there. Yep. So you know that one of them is, is not where it should be. And that was, so, the, yeah, the one that went up. Yeah. So. <laughs> can we speculate that it, you know, impinges somewhere and then because you have a beating heart over a period of time, because it's such a sharp little thing that it just, it gets, it just burrows its way through and ends up where it ends up. Yeah. Just because the heart's beating and it just perforates somewhere randomly. Yeah, yeah. This other one, it looked like it was, yeah. I mean, a lot of these look where they shouldn't be. And I, I'm always amazed at how they can actually get out most of the filter. I mean, this looks like it would be kind of epithelialized and fixed, but, you know, they got out most of the struts there. So, <laughs> And um, there was the other case 
that that I showed a few years ago that we saw there um, that had discitis osteomyelitis where the prong was going into a vertebral body. So yeah, yeah we we've seen a whole host of complications from those. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, and um, here's here's another um, case here. Um, this is you know HeartMate two LVAD, and um, I thought I'd seen kind of the last few of this particular complication a couple of years ago, um, but it turns out that I was wrong. Um, you know, you can look at the structure of the, you know, the inflow here, the um, little bend relief here, the elbow connectors, and then look at the other bend relief here. Um, just keep that in mind, that, that configuration. And um, let me go to the CT. Um, this patient was having, you know, LVAD alarms and um, you know, bad flows through the um, through the device, and so you can see the outflow there looks okay. There's no stenosis or kinking, but you start to look at the um, outflow graft, and you know, large amount of thrombus within it, only a small amount of pacified lumen. Um, interestingly, let me show you the um, reformats on this, the um, coronal and sagittal, um, because we've we've had a number of these cases, not just of um, LVAD thrombus, but look how it looks like, I wasn't sure at first, but the more I looked at this, um, it looks like it's in the wrap um, around the outflow. And you can see it in the sagittal in particular that it kind of blends in with, there's a wrap around the outflow, around a portion of it. And it looks like this is largely within that wrap. Um, doesn't make it any less um, concerning because of course it's um, compressing severely the lumen of the um, outflow there. But you can see that the reason for this, presumably, is the dislodged um, bend relief down here. And it's almost better to look at it on the coronal here. Let me show you. Um, presumably, the these are, are modular. And so you can see here that um, this should be continuous here. But this is going this way, the bend relief. And this is going that way, um, the modular connector there. And so, you know, due to, um, you know, turbulent flow and just um, lack of adequate flow through there, you can get thrombus. And, you know, why this went into the, um, the wrap, um, you know, we've seen cases of little holes being created um, in the graft because of this sort of uh, dislodged uh, bend relief. Uh, so that could have been responsible for why it looks like most of this is actually in the, um, in the, uh, the uh, wrap instead of in the lumen. So. Uh, but just a good case of a, um, you know, heart made to dislodged uh, bend relief causing this uh, complication. So, I mean, these were these were recalled, um, you know, I think in 2013 because of this known problem with the modular component of the bend relief. Um, so, you know, this this patient had their procedure done before that. So, anyway, I just thought that was a good case of LVAD thrombus that's largely within the wrap and due to dislodged bend relief. But going back to the um, you know, the, the radiograph here, you can see it, um, you know, you can see that, let me look at, let me show you again. Yeah, you can see the dislodged bend relief right there. It should be continuous like that, it's dislodged. So the, I think the distinction you make there is important since it's not a thrombus in the lumen that you have to treat this surgically and not with anticoagulation, right? Right, right, and what they, I'm not showing you the follow up, but they actually um, decided to, um, may not be a, you know, the cure for this, but they, they stented it and um, they opened up the lumen, um, but they knew that, you know, it's not, anticoagulation is not going to help. And, um, you know, and, and, and so they just mechanically expanded it. So um, we'll see how it does over time because the, the problem still remains that the, um, the bin relief is dislodged. So the flow is not going to be the same, you know, through that. So. So ordinarily there's no communication between the lumen the blood containing lumen of the outflow cannula and the the wrap as you call it but somehow right. th somehow that was created so blood went into a space that should normally contain nothing and and clotted there right so um, normally you know we've seen a number of these that um, fibrinous material that presumably is due to a little micro um, perforation into that wrap um, will create, over time, will create some, um, you know, fibrinous material within that that then um, kind of, you know, doesn't really narrow the lumen, 
it just creates a concentric sort of ring around the and creates no compression. But this is a case where clearly something more must have happened and more blood got in there, couldn't escape, you know, congealed and narrowed the, the lumen, you know, is what it, it looks like the more, you know, we look at this. So uh, because it starts and stops right where the wrap is starting and stopping and it has these margins here. You know. okay, so we can see by virtue of the little rings how far the uh, that wrap goes, and that's the portion too that contains the clotted blood under pressure. Right, right. That's what it looks like. I mean, when I first saw this case, I I didn't know because you know it looks so bad down here, especially that you know can't be sure what's in the lumen, what's not. Also, it, it's very eccentric, so I wasn't sure how that could have happened, but. The more you kind of look at this, I mean, it starts and stops right there, you yes. know, which is where the wrap is. And so you can't really, you know, make a good argument for this being, you know, just within, you know, uh, primarily within the lumen. So, you know. Okay. So that, that right. large module somehow tore the structure of the wrap somehow. Tore. Yes. And I've seen, you know, we've had hematomas that develop, um, you know, because of some sort of, you know, when this, when this modular component comes off, becomes dislodged like this, apparently there's a little sharp uh, angle and it can um, perforate. Yes. And so we've seen hematomas created, you know, they go into the abdominal wall like that um, and, and surgically proven holes in the graft because of this sort of um, configuration. So um, so why could that not cause the hole like in the, in the in, you know, leading to the wrap here? Yeah. yeah, that's probably what happened. Yeah, that sagittal is uh, very interesting. What, uh, Brent, what is the material that, that, um, that the pipe is made of that's within the wrap? Is it uh, Dacron or is it plastic or what? I, I think it's a form of Dacron, you know. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure actually, like, I, I should know, but I'm not sure what this actual wrap is made of, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's obviously some material like Dacron too, so. Okay. But anyway, those are my cases for this week. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. David, are you ready now for a few? Yes, I, I think I'm no longer prone to aspiration. <clears throat> yeah, so, we, you don't want to end up as a case yet, do you? That's right. You don't want to be an interesting case. Okay, so this is a, uh, a fairly young uh, individual, I think uh, 14 years old, with um, intractable cough, and you know it's not eating very well and um is losing weight so we have this radiograph here i'll show you a lateral i'll show you a lateral i believe so here's the lateral view and there's a sharp lower margin to this opacity here that occupies the left uh upper chest here and this um this individual went on and died and um with the weight loss and all, this was determined to be a lung cancer, but there was no autopsy on this on this young person here, only 14, um, of the canine persuasion, in case you haven't tumbled to that. So this was a presumed lung cancer in a dog. I've, when I was shown this case with the left upper lung uh, consolidation here and this little device here, I thought this might be an aspiration, but it turns out that this is the chip that um, identifies most most dogs and the chip is implanted here. So this was not an obstructing foreign body and associated with the airway. This was a subcutaneous identification chip for this dog. So this was, um, this was, this dog was owned by uh, friends of one of the, one of my colleagues here at work. So I was asked to look at the chest radiographs. My first canine case in a long time. And then let me show you the, the um, saga here of a woman who had a replacement of her earlier hip replacement. So this is post-op the second time on this, this current surgery, which was just a few weeks ago. She uh, had had several dislocations, 10 dislocations of her previous total hip replacement. And so they went in and replaced the uh, acetabular component here and they put these screws into the pelvis. They left the femoral component alone. She did fine for four days after the surgery. And then uh, she came to the emergency room because she was short of breath and had this radiograph here with diffuse lung disease, much worse on the right than the left. And um, 
there may be a slightly big heart here. She had a CT scan at this time, and um, it shows this widespread ground glass abnormality here with rather sharp demarcation um, against spared lobules. So this lobule is involved, and then a sharp boundary against a spared lobule, similarly spared lobule scattered around here. Uh, and some dilation of her pulmonary artery here. So an echocardiography, she had modest uh, pulmonary artery hypertension. She also had a dilated RV on echo. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that with some septal uh, flattening here or straightening. So um, her subsequent chest radiograph was even worse. So now her diffuse lung disease, at this point she's feeling better as pretty much becomes symmetrical and involves the left lung to the same extent as the right almost. And she's got this dilation of her azygous vein here, which I think reflects her systemic venous hypertension um, backing up here because of her pulmonary hypertension. So uh, she was treated with steroids here because of presumptive fat embolism syndrome. Now the orthopedists who admitted her when she became short of breath were skeptical of that diagnosis. They said, they didn't like the time course because she was fine for four days after the surgery. They hadn't messed with the femoral components, so they didn't think that they had, you know, dislodged any marrow where, and there's more marrow evidently in the femur than there is in the pelvis. But I've seen people who've had pedicle screws placed for spine surgery, spine straightening surgery. They'll get, a, you know, they get these columns of pedicle screws, multiple vertebral bodies and they develop diffuse lung disease and shortness of breath. I think placing a screw into uh, marrow, such as marrow in the pelvis or spine, is enough to dislodge some fat globules. Now, there were no confirmatory tests uh, in her in terms of looking at her eye grounds or urine tests and things like that. Uh, they felt they were pretty confident. The, the intensive care docs who ultimately took care of this patient were pretty confident of the diagnosis and passed it back. So this is presumptive fat emboli syndrome from her uh, total hip revision. And the pulmonary hypertension goes with that. The mechanism here is that the fat globules actually obstruct small vessels near the capillaries, and there's a mechanical blockade that would strain the heart. Then as the fat globules break down, they liberate free fatty acids, which are very irritating, and which incite an inflammatory response, and that's the rationale for treating with steroids. So she was treated with these measures. She got better. At the time of the second chest radiograph, although the radiograph looked worse, she was actually feeling better, and she was discharged uh, yesterday. So pretty dramatic case of presumptive, I think strongly presumptive, uh, fat embolism syndrome. And uh, I, asked, I asked our trauma radiologists at Harborview whether they see this commonly, and I was surprised to hear that they don't see it despite the huge volume of trauma that they see. So fat embolism, I think, is not, is not um, diagnosed as frequently as I would have expected from all that trauma, or maybe, maybe it's manifest, maybe it's mistaken for other causes of ARDS, you know, given that there's trauma and that can precipitate ARDS. Okay, have you guys seen fat embolism? Like, is this, uh, you know, really the CT pattern is consistent with published cases. I haven't looked them up myself though. Yeah, not in the context of uh, arthroplasty, hip arthroplasty, but imaging wise, that fits as you indicate. Okay. Very. And then, then this is a woman with cystic fibrosis and um, she's got a lot of scarring in her apices, a lot of bronchial disease, some big cavities in her apex probably derived from bronchi, and then there are these occupants in these cavities here. So she's got mycetomas sitting in her apical cavities. And let me show you on CT scan, these big um, mycetomas here in these large apical cavities here on both sides. And uh, she was readmitted this last week, her she's a lot in a lot more respiratory distress. She's now has a tracheostomy and everything like this. This is um, this is her current imaging, and at this point, her chest radiograph is worse than the chest radiograph I just showed you. But I just want to show you these bilateral mycetomas occupying here, her apical cavities, and uh, so we presume that this is going to be aspergillus. But this is a case of pseudalluria 
Boidii, which often behaves like aspergillus. I've seen it involved in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Again, it's not really aspergillus in that setting, but pseudalasuria boidii, which is also known as Scetosporium angiospermum, which is a different, they call it an anamorph, a different shape of the same organism. I don't know whether it's a different stage of its life cycle or different conditions that cause it to change shape. But these two uh, terms are applied to this. So her, her fungus, in this case, occupying, forming mycetomas occupying these cavities, is uh, slightly unusual. It's pseudalasuria or Scetosporium, depending on your um, nomenclature preference. So uh, another situation in which this fungus can imitate um, aspergillus. That's very impressive. Do you think, David, that uh, those cavities actually represent a severe form of bronchiectasis or a destructive form of bronchiectasis? That is, they start off with a dilated bronchus that eventually becomes what we call a big cavity. I, 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 that's I, exactly what I think happens in these cases. Yeah. I've seen drumstick-shaped um, dilated bronchi in the apices before where, it, remember those uh, frozen things you got out of the, when you were a kid? They were called drumsticks. They were this ice cream cone that came all pre-frozen. It had this, um, it was, so it was conical shaped. It had this rounded top with uh, chocolate coating the ice cream. So I've seen bronchi with that shape where they start out narrow at the hilum and then they just become bigger as they branch out toward the apex. And this has that kind of shape, that drumstick, uh, which was the name of that ice cream confection, that drumstick shape. Yeah. to it. So I think this is derived from bronchi. Ultimately, I think the bronchus probably breaks down and you just yep. get a cavity, as you said. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the lucency around it is the M-O-N-O-D -O -O monod, Olivier monod sign. And right. I think that, I'd have to check, but I think monod, the Frenchman, um, described it as a bronchoseal containing the fungus ball. Uh-huh. Um, okay. I have to check. I think he used the term bronchoseal in his description of it back back when. I do have the article, so I pull it out. Yeah, we call this mon the monad sign. We try to distinguish it in the resonance minds from uh, the air crescent sign, which yeah. is a different manifestation of aspergillus, where you're actually talking about invasive aspergillus. This is just passive occupation here of these of these cavities here by mycetoma. So this although it's crescent-like, should not be called air crescent sign because it confuses people with manifestations of invasive aspergillus versus just passive occupation, mycetoma kind of aspergillus. Yep. Very interesting. Okay. Those are my cases. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to show a few. I don't see anyone else on at the moment that... All right, let me start with this one. Uh, this is a patient, I'll give you some more history in a moment, that at this time was looking okay, at least in the chest. Uh, back in January of this year, she had apparently soft tissue masses on an extremity and received a diagnosis of a lymphoma. It presented in that fashion. She was treated with a regimen for lymphoma um, around about that time. And I think this is maybe the time when the lymphoma was diagnosed, when her chest looked okay. But I think I'm about to take that back because back in February, well, the, there is an opacity there. We're trying to get the timing of things. So keep that in mind. There is an abnormality there. And let me just remind myself to the extent of the extent to which she has lymph nodes. So she does have lymphoma and she does have this opacity in the lung in February. I'll show you that in a moment. And there's some additional opacities lower down. So abnormal lungs. But then in March, in contrast, she gets very sick. And you will see that her lungs now look pretty awful. Um, there's a lot of unsharpness from breathing, but you can see now there is a diffuse process in her lungs, consolidative, and 
if you look behind it and you try to look through the blurring from the from the respiration in the sick patient, um, I think you might get the idea even here that there's some background little nodules in between. But I'll show you <clears throat> more of that in a bit. And she has pericardial fluid, so she's very sick at that time. Um, at that time, she then received a diagnosis via BAL of coccidioidomycosis, as you can see there. Cultures were positive for a fungus, speciated as, as coxy, and she was treated for that. So she has diffuse coxy, but also nodules. Here, after treatment some months later, she's a lot better, but you can see the small nodules throughout her lungs that still remain. So this is a case of opportunistic coxy. I don't know whether she traveled to a place and was exposed to coxy, that I don't know. But it's a very interesting diffuse nodular and miliary nodular and diffuse consolidative opacity. And something that they speciated out, I guess, yeah, culture for coxy. That's very interesting. So Howard, do you think the, what's the, what's the interval between the original CT with the big blobs and the later CT with the diffuse lung disease? Yes, that was February. And right. one is the next month. Okay. So it's probably coxy all along, not two processes then in the lung. Yeah, I think so. Maybe the nodal disease was part of the lymphoma. I don't know. But she did have opacities back in February. So not too much of an interval between these, sorry, between these. Oh, just a few weeks, really. Okay. So I don't know. You know, this is, this is certainly consistent with a a focus of coxy, as is this for that matter. Right. So it's really interesting how she got that, and then it became very diffuse and very sick to look like that. So her lymphoma probably pre predisposed in her chemo to um, to dissemination, but you know it's also tends to disseminate in dark skinned people, particularly Filipinos. And stuff like that. I don't know whether she has any ethnic background that also predisposes to dissemination of coxie. Yeah. I was looking to try and remind myself whether somewhere in this period they said that she maybe went away for a time and maybe she went somewhere and got the coxie and came back and got very sick. Somewhere in here, but I don't know that. So, very interesting presentation. Let me show you this one. Uh, this is some imaging from the outside. So I don't know in detail how this patient presented. I'm going to assume that, based on what I'll show you in a moment, that chest pain was part of a presentation. So this is the frontal and lateral projection. Let me just flip this around so we look at it in the usual way, if I remember how to do that orientation like that. So we have pleural fluid. And at initial glance, I think one can go by a lot of pathology. So let me just show you the frontal just for a moment, because pleural fluid is not what's that interesting. Let me bring up the lateral, which I think is particularly interesting. So I'm going to um, just do not a region of interest for region of interest purposes, but if I can just do a region of interest to indicate where there's a lot of pathology. So I'm going to call this just uh, flippantly sort of the, the red rectangle of really badness in there. So I gave a lecture to our residents um, a little while ago on the lateral chest, and I emphasize when looking at the hilar region to look for the left upper lobe bronchus, the intermediate stem line, the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. And what we have here is, number one, you cannot see a normal intermediate stem line. And the amount of opacity here in general is too much for sure for just, for example, a right pulmonary, a left pulmonary artery in here. So usually that fills in with nodal disease particularly, but there's a lot of pathology there. So let me make that go away. I 
10. Uh, let's see if I can just make that go away a second. And then I will bring in for the lateral projection. Oh, the other thing I want to show you before I do that, now that I remember, is right up here, if you look at the location of the calcified atheromatous plaques in the aorta, they appear to be okay, except here, where there seems to be, if this is the aortic wall up here, too much distance between what may be the aortic wall and the intimal-based calcified atheromatous plaques. So let me show you the sagittal now to show you how much pathology is there. So let me not bring up the MIP series, but let me bring up the non-MIP series on the sagittal. So take a look here and see how much pathology is there. So look at the lumen of the aorta and the atheroma. And then, of course, none of this here should be there. So there is a lot of contrast medium, as well as a lot of opacity in the mediastinum that makes up all that opacity on radiography. So here is lumen, here is disrupted atheromatous calcium, and this big hole, really, where the contrast medium is coming out. Let me show you the, some thins to give you a feel for how much pathology is here. So this is clearly, I think, a pseudoaneurysm. And a lot of contrast medium is outside of the lumen. There's a lot of opacity surrounding it, presumably blood clot and whatnot. It's, it's almost hard to imagine that this person's alive because this is such a big defect. So let me go back and on a follow-up, I think I'm looking for the non-contrast series, which is the exam that we did. And... If I had done this first, I'd be looking for, in part, whether there's hyperattenuating clot in relation to the aortic wall or outside of the aortic wall. So as we go down, I think, I think down here, maybe about here somewhere, you can see there's pathology in the aortic wall. So there is some, I believe, intramural eccentric clot. So I'd like to think that perhaps this is a, a form of maybe started as a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. There's some component of intramural clot, but otherwise a really disrupted wall with, in effect, a pseudoaneurysm, right? Anyone else have any thoughts about that, or do you think that's a reasonable explanation for all these findings? Sounds good to me. The, um, it's really an impressive, I, I was expecting this was going to be lymphoma or something like that with all of that stuff, all that lymphadenopathy, what looked like lymphadenopathy, but I've never seen aortic pathology extend in like that. It almost looks as if it's getting in front of the airway too. It's definitely below the, below the airway on lateral view. We talk about the hyalur donut sign, you know, as tissue underneath the left, the left bronchus being abnormal on lateral view because that completes the arc with right pulmonary artery in front of the black hole and left pulmonary artery over the top and behind. Shouldn't have tissue underneath the black hole, the left box that completes the donut or bagel. And in this case, it was all hematoma. That's amazing. Yeah, very impressive. As you might imagine, they put a stent in and I think this person actually did okay in spite of this big defect and the bleeding and everything. Howard, was there any uh, any fever or signs of infection that suggested that was mycotic or do you think it was just the uh, you know, penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer that ruptured? Not that I recall. And you know, the surgeons knew they had to repair this. That was That's what they did and um, no, not, not fever as far as I know. And Leif showed me this case, so thanks to him for that. Um, I think we presume that maybe it started off as a penetrating ulcer and, and went right through the wall and produced all the findings we see here. It's a great location for that, descending aorta, but just the most dramatic thing I've seen in quite a while. Yeah, that's really dramatic. 
All right. For the last five minutes, I'll show you this one, a very interesting case as well. So this person uh, in December looked like that. About a week later, when she was quite ill, she looks like this. So now she has very diffuse abnormality in both lungs, right, worse than left. And of course, there's a big differential diagnosis for that. Um, I'll withhold a little bit of information. Um, she developed some symptoms, I think, um, after a presumptive diagnosis was made related to her nervous system. And she had findings there consistent with, particularly, I think, on a, uh, a restriction, diffusion restriction series consistent with embolic phenomena. So we have hyper intensities on the sequence, subcortical related to the uh, occipital regions, uh, the left frontal region right there, uh, parietal region, uh, certainly consistent with an, an embolic phenomenon. So around about here, I think she did have hemoptysis and she was diagnosed on the basis of that and some other things with systemic lupus and hemorrhage as well as the findings you see on the brain MRI. And the source of that is what you see here in relation to the mitral valve. So here we have the atrium and the ventricle. And that's playing a bit fast, but here we have the mitral valve. So this clearly is very consistent with Libman Sachs endocarditis, that non-infectious endocarditis of SLE, where you form non-infectious vegetations on a valve. In this case, I think it's perhaps most commonly the mitral, as far as I remember, with an embolic phenomenon to the brain. So this poor patient really experienced some bad things from her SLE. And subsequently, that actually got bigger, I believe, and they decided to replace that valve so on a subsequent admission, worsening endocarditis. And here you see the op report. There was regurgitation, the mitral valve abnormality, and the tissue consistent with libman sachs endocarditis. So a lot of interesting findings on the CT, on the, uh, on the whole case, hemorrhage, wow. and, and that's a pretty, pretty bad case of SLE and its complications. and uh, nephritis too, so this poor person had a lot of bad things. All right, everyone, it's close to two o'clock, so thanks for all those cases. Thank you. And same place, same time next week. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.